Welcome, welcome, welcome to Above Replacement Radio. I am your host, Chris Gianta. You know what Christy Matthewson wor- wasn't worried about? S-I-E-R-A. When you're thinking about Pedro Siriaco, I mean, the only one that can compete is maybe uh, Hannes Wagner's 1908 season. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Kern. Like, if we just clip together every time we've talked about him on other people's profiles, we've done a Mickey Cochran episode. I can't get past Rabbit Marinville. It's you know, it's not necessarily Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily above average, but we can guarantee you we are better than just the standard replacement level college sophomore. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio, where we're talking baseball kind of whenever. I am your host, Christianta, over there across from me, as you cannot see on YouTube, unfortunately, is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I am doing extremely well today. What a weekend it was. I mean, getting to watch live real baseball again, that felt so good. I watched an exuberant amount of baseball last weekend. Uh, I think from like Thursday to, on Thursday I went from like 1 to 12, and it was like the same thing every single day. Yeah, right, 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 yeah. I not say at this point. Like there are two months out of the out of the year where I like don't mess around, and it's April and October. Right, that's true. Yeah, October I definitely like, you know, it affects my life around me, mm-hmm. and uh, the people I love, they lose touch with me for, <laughs> uh, you know, those three or four weeks. Mm-hmm. But but I come back. I come back. I do. Um, uh, yeah, I have a funny thing with with four game Friday. Odd. Yes, you fun, do. Funnily enough, <laughs> I won't get into it today. Maybe 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 a maybe down a later. The line. Maybe down the line. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's funny now, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you know, it's been it's been fun seeing uh competitive baseball, especially after a time where it was a little bit in doubt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean it's it's hard not to overreact to everything <laughs> yep it's the the rays are gonna go 162 and 0 yes D- don't look at who they played it doesn't matter right right <laughs> right <laughs> um yeah it's hard not to overreact yet yeah, like uh you know it's hard not to picture you know Stephen kwan is american league mvp it's hard to picture him hitting below 700 yeah yeah it is um so yeah we're we're, we're trying not to overreact but it's it's just it's the hardest thing not to do um but uh i don't know should, when when should we get into well, where should we start here with with this weekend i'll take i'll so i prepared a few takeaways um i feel like we should just start with some general stuff um yeah i don't know what if i mean like i guess maybe some teams uh the diamondbacks that was cool St- steph beer hitting the walk off home run on yeah. national beer day um <laughs> That was such a weird weekend for the Diamondbacks because they otherwise would have gotten swept in a four-game series. They had, I think, two hits all game. Uh, one of them was in the seventh to break up uh, the no-hitter for you, Darvish. <laughs> and, at the, and like, they went into the ninth trailing 2 nothing, and it was like walk, walk, hit by pitch, walk, home run, or something like that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty wild. Uh, and, yeah, the Diamondbacks, Diamondbacks, you know... Them and the Padres cannot just just cannot avoid the threat of no hitters mm-hmm. with Tyler Gilbert last year. Uh, Blake Snell had seven no hit innings against the D backs, and then now, you Darvish had what six? And Sean Manaya had six, or maybe even seven. Yeah, oh. Sean Manaya had seven. Then Tim Hill. I'm pretty sure Tim Hill came in after the relievers or after the starters came out and immediately gave up hits in both games. Like yeah. first battery faced. Yeah, it's like let's you know let's kill the excitement here a little bit. Uh, yeah, so that you know, that was cool. Good, good opening day for them. But you know, it reminds us that yeah, it's only opening day. <laughs> the Red Sox, the Red Sox in twenty eighteen, their opening day consisted of a of a of them blowing a four run lead, very mm-hmm. uh, and and then they won however like uh, hundred eight games, hundred nineteen yeah, total. But like even. How'd they, how'd they start? They started like 17 and 2. Yeah. So they won 17 of their next 18 after that. <laughs> but but again, it's hard not to overreact. Yeah. Um, other just general things, I'm trying to think of like uh, teams that did well, pitcher, just teams that did anything notable. Um, did you see that Javier Baez walk off on th- Friday? I, I sort of did. I. Did it? It seemed like there was like a dropped fly ball. It hit. It hit off the top of the wall and then bounced into AJ Pollock's glove. 
Okay. And he tried to sell that he caught it. He didn't. It yeah. hit off the wall. Um, the Nationals and Astros City Connect jerseys look nice. They do. They yeah. do. Um, Nationals and who else have had the City Connect jerseys? The Astros. Astros, yeah. I haven't seen the Astros. I know the... The Space City ones. Nice. The Nationals, uh, yeah, they've been... They ha- they kind of had a very... Lo- looked like a lot of the architecture they have in Washington. Mm-hmm. Like the, with, it was the Cherry Blossom. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it was just kind of like gray like yeah. grayish but it looked it looks it looks it looked okay it did look nice um yeah that was cool no there were no sweeps or did no s- no the razor were the only one who did they play again the orioles okay yeah oh yeah that doesn't really count yeah the Rays, there were no real sweeps yeah the Rays, yeah the team that went 18 and 1 against the orioles last <laughs> yeah. year this year they're going for 19 and 0 they're going for 19 and 0 Although they, um, if they if they didn't lose that one game maybe they would have beaten the red Sox in the division series potentially um, the rockies took two out of three from the dodgers yeah right right uh that was at coors mm-hmm. i'll be getting into one of those uh games later so we can save that one i guess nice nice um yeah other than that uh cubs took two out of three from the brewers with their top three going say suzuki homered off freddie peralta Right, right. Uh, oh yeah, the the Corbin Burns thing tickled my fancy. He, yeah. It's in twenty twenty. Yeah, in twenty twenty one, it took him uh, one hundred twenty seven batters to walk his his first batter, and in twenty twenty two, it took one batter. <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, also, I think that at this point, the Twins have only scored on home runs, which makes sense. That's why. Why, why else would they? That's score? so funny. <laughs> How else would they score? I think uh, Sarah Langs had a tweet where she was like, the first 16 runs they scored were home runs, and like only a few other teams had never done that in like the last 100 years or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I want to find the, ex- the exact stat. That's pretty wild. Um, yeah, that's pretty crazy that the Twins have scored, yeah, three games in which all their runs were home runs. They also scored like 10 runs yesterday. Quan base percentage. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that from Jeremy Frank at MLB Random Stats. That's that's too good. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Well, that's kind of that's kind of all the general stuff. Um, I guess I can get into my first big takeaway from the weekend, and uh, it was the Apple TV broadcast. I don't know if you got a chance to watch it, Chris, but um, I was watching the uh, Angels and Astros game on. I think it was it was either Thursday night or Friday night. I think it was Friday night, and they had this little feature on the um, like on the broadcast in the bottom right corner where it would take you through the at bat. Like in in each count, it would tell you like the percent odds of how the at bat was going to end. Like which was an inherently a pretty cool thing. Like every time you know, another pitch was thrown, it would change based on what happened on that pitch, uh, and like the concept of it seemed pretty cool. But it was just blatant lies the entire time. <laughs> so I, 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 wrote, I wrote some of this down so I could share it with you. Uh, so I paid attention to this for four plate appearances all in a row, which was the only time I really paid attention because I realized how ridiculous it was. Okay, so we're just going to start off. Shohei Otani is up at the plate, right? It's a 1-0 count. What do you think the percent chance is, according to this broadcast, that he reaches base? Um, percent broad percent chance uh that Shohei Otani reaches base on a 1-0 count um 540 f- f- or 54 percent chance 54 percent chance the league average is probably like 370 after 1-0 ish yeah. right uh, according to this broadcast he had a 29 percent chance to reach base <laughs> <What>? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense and that's the least weird of all of these oh my okay, god so uh Mike Trout is up next and he's in an 0-2 count and it gives him a 26% chance, which actually makes sense. Like that, it's, <laughs> even if it's Mike Trout, you know, 0-2 count, it's hard to dig yourself out of that hole. 26% seems reasonable, right? Yeah. And the pitcher throws one ball, and it goes to 43%. <laughs> <laughs> a 430 OVP through a 1-2 count. <laughs> like, like I don't, maybe that's a Trout thing, but I think it's crazy that it went up that much. Yeah. And even if it really is a Trout thing, this is what really got me. So it's a 1-2 count. The next pitch, Mike Trout fouls off, and it goes to forty percent. <laughs> he hit, he hit a foul ball. It doesn't change the count at all. Right. Yeah. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's weird. Um, 
so then the next one was Anthony Rendon. Uh, I'm going to have you guess for this one again. Comes up to the plate, 0 count. Just standard Anthony Rendon coming to plate. What's the chance he gets on base? Um, you know, how it should be. Give you, like, I was going to say, give your guess and give your guess for the broadcast. It should be like 35, 36% chance ish. Uh, maybe if you bias like his last couple years, maybe 33% chance. But, or, and not the last couple years, last year. Um, but the broadcast had him at 21%. 18%. No way. 18% chance Anthony <laughs> Rendon gets on base. <laughs> Just coming up to the plate. And then the pitcher throws a first pitch strike, and it goes to 23%. It are, goes up. <laughs> who, yeah, that that's weird. Who are they facing? The Astros. Uh, was it any, any particular pitcher? Like a really Honestly, g- I don't even remember. It probably <laughs> wasn't Verlander or anything. No, it wasn't. It was the Friday game. Uh Trying to remember, who, I think uh, Jake Odorizzi started that game. Yeah, that's not it's not someone who's which like s- then again it could have been a reliever. I honestly don't remember what point of the game this was. I was just dumbfounded by this whole thing. But just in general, how does how does an O one count increase the chances of getting on base? Yeah, no, it doesn't. By five percent, <laughs> it went from eighteen percent to twenty three percent. And the last one, uh, Alex Bregman comes up the next inning. It's an O O count. Percent chance he gets on base is 37%. Actually yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that it does. Takes a first pitch ball. Where do you think it goes? Well, it should go to like 48%. I'm going to say it went down. It did go down. Where do you think it went? <laughs> 22%. 23%. You no. actually like were close <laughs> to nailing it. It went down f- uh, 14% <laughs> after a first pitch ball. <laughs> Oh, my God. After it went up, after a first pitch strike to Rendon, like, yeah. this brought, like, I was I was actually very entertained, but then I was just like, I can't do this anymore. This is just, like, breaking my brain. Right, uh, right. So that was the that was my experience with the Apple TV broadcast. The, the idea of, like, the concept seemed cool. I would just love some accurate numbers. I think that'd be pretty dope. Uh, because yep. that whole thing was just, it was lies. None of that's true. Yeah, that seems... <laughs> Seems a bit, uh, yeah, that seems a bit crazy mm-hmm. <laughs> for for that to happen. Um, so yeah, I guess that leads to um, my takeaway. I'm can I can I steal this uh, real quick? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the Sarah Lang's tweet I was talking about. She said, "Quote: The Twins scored each of their first 13 runs of the season via home run, the longest streak of runs only coming on the home run to start the season for any team since at least 1961, which is the expansion era." So that was a dope stat. Nice. Nice. Yeah. That's that's a very good stat. Uh so my uh yeah, my little takeaway, uh it definitely has to do with on the field stuff, but uh something I think you know, I I guess one start doesn't define it, but he already had a great year last year after um after a like you know, after a a, a very good year that, but it was his first very good year, and he got a uh, he got some money in the off season. Uh, Carlos Rodon, mm-hmm. he had twelve strikeouts in five innings, albeit it was the Miami Marlins, one of the worst uh, lineups in baseball right now. Fifty uh, percent whiff rate uh, on the day. That's that's crazy. Pretty insane. What was his called strike and whiff rate? Um, his slider had a fifty-seven percent whiff rate. Nice. That's been. You know his best pitch, uh, you know over the over her his you know successful span, um, and uh, his fastball was averaging ninety seven point four, you know, kind of where he, where he likes to have it, and I think it kind of solidifies to me a little bit, maybe not all the way, but you know I think we should expect continued success from Carlos Rodon. You know, next last year probably wasn't. Uh, that fluky but you know we all saw a strikeout rate go up crazy high you know didn't have a high walk rate um and yeah like 12 strikeouts in five innings even if it's even if it is the the miami merlin's offense um you know that's something uh something that giants fans should be very happy with and uh you know as long as as he stays healthy he should be you know 
like probably competing with Logan Webb for the number one yeah. spot. I feel like a lot of people forget going into the All Star break last year. Like he was the American League Cy Young. Mm-hmm. Like it was him and Garrett Cole. Yeah, he was right up there. Yeah, he had a crazy good start. Uh, and yeah, you mentioned it. If he stays healthy, that's that's the thing. Yep. Um, yeah, no, very good start from Carlos Rodon. I think he has the he has the most strikeouts in a single game so far this year. Granted, it's been four days, but still. Yeah. Also, five strikeouts. That's crazy. Um, or five five innings. Yeah, yeah, 12 yeah. strikeouts. Um, my second takeaway was yesterday, the debut of Hunter Green. That was a lot of fun. Uh, that, like, for me, watching that was the peak of, like, my new age of watching baseball. Like, it's one one eye is on the TV screen, one eye is on baseball savant. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like every single because I had so many stats lined up, and if you if you follow my Twitter, you know that I tweeted a hundred seven times for Hunter Green once for every mile per hour on his fastball. Yeah, um, like I had a ton of stats lined up for when he got there, and he just kept getting there. Um, so like just to name a few of the stats that I tweeted, um, no red starting pitcher has ever thrown more than ten hundred mile per hour fastballs since two thousand eight. Just in general, like in yeah. and in general, uh, Hunter Green threw twenty of them yesterday. Yeah, that's just in his major league debut. Luis on an April day uh, in uh, it was in Cincinnati. It was in Atlanta, so it uh, might have been a little okay, warmer, but, yeah. but still, April weather is April weather. Yeah, um, that was really cool. Uh, he set the record on ninety nine. Uh, mile an hour pitches from red starters on his 43rd career pitch <laughs> that was that was in a single game on his 59th pitch it was uh more 100 mile per hour fastballs <laughs> than any pitcher in red's history it took him 59 pitches that's not 59 fastballs because obviously he was mixing in some off speed which was like 85 yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's ridiculous uh like that guy is must watch baseball um, and the last stat that I will share, actually, I have two more stats. Um, so he had 45 pitches that were 99 miles per hour or higher. Um, and he became the third person in the pitch tracking era to have at least 45, 99 mile per hour pitches in a single game. The other two were Nathan Uvaldi on August 19th, 2015 and Noah Syndergaard on May 11th, 2016. So it's been five and a half years. Since yeah. the last time someone was throwing that hard uh, on that large of a basis, and yeah. that was Hunter, Gr- that was his debut. Like that yeah. was start one. Uh, yeah, you need to watch that guy every single time. Yeah, he's unbelievable. Uh, I think number two overall pick in the 2017 draft. He was he was taken as a two way player too. That's <laughs> that's very funny. Uh, yeah, you know, gr- you know, great stuff. You know, throwing a hundred miles per hour with frequency mm-hmm. yeah he's uh he's gonna be fun to watch um yeah. probably for a while uh so my, my, my sorry my last my last stat just because this is i mean this has something to do with hunter green but it's not centered around him probably the most amazing part of the game was that matt chapman's or not matt chapman matt olsen squared up two of his fastest pitches of the day <laughs> he threw 101 twice or i'm sorry he threw 101 i think five times Two of those went to Matt Olson, and he squared up both of them. One of them was a 108 mile an hour sing- single that he pulled on the inside part of the plate. I'm not kidding. Like it's low and inside to Matt Olson, 101. He rips it out to right field for a single, and I was like, "What? <laughs> like, how is that even possible?" And then next at bat, he throws him 101 like upstairs, and he takes it to left center field on a line for a home run. Wow! Like go go watch Matt Ch- Matt Olson's two base hits from uh, Sunday against Hunter Green. Like it doesn't make any sense how he a was able to make contact with either of them, but b square them up and hit them at least a hundred uh, hundred eight and one hundred ten miles an hour. Uh, he became the first player in the Statcast era to hit multiple one hundred five mile per hour batted balls against pitches of at least a hundred miles per hour in a single game. Yeah, that's a uh, a pretty wild stat there. Um, my, uh, my second takeaway, um, also kind of basic, but, you know, I think it's something we, we already knew. And I think, um, you know, kind of in the back of our minds, but, uh, Red Sox, Yankees, very competitive, extremely Mm -hmm. competitive series. Um, you know, all, uh, all the games were decided by two or less. Um, 
there was an extra innings game to start the series. And I feel like every year, outside of like when the Red Sox do very badly, every year like it it's like ten to nine, yep. uh, Red Sox Yankees, and I expect more of the same, and I expect them to be fighting, you know, for like third it, place in the division. Yeah, for like a wild for that like six wild card spot. <laughs> Uh, and that's going to be fun. You know, I, I think the Blue Jays and Rays are going to be ahead of them, but I think it'll end up where, and, and we both, we both had them in, uh, third and fourth place. Uh, just the order was a little different in, in the AL East. So, and you know, it would probably align correctly that, uh, you know, they might be fighting with, you know, some other teams in the, uh, in that six wild card spot, yes. uh, you know that, you know six fifth. You know th- one of the three wild card spots in uh, in the American League playoffs. Um, so that should be fun. I, I haven't looked at the schedule to see like when they're going to be battling. You know maybe in September, but uh, you know those games are fun. They're uh, you know they're going to stay fun. Very competitive. Very long games still. I had to ex- <laughs> I had to explain that uh, to someone who wasn't very familiar with baseball i was like yeah for some reason inexplicably these games go like an extra half hour (laughs) yep um but yeah so that was my second takeaway from uh this weekend of baseball yeah um every game that they played the red sox and yankees this weekend like they could have been decided by either team until the last pitch yes like like obviously game one was a walk-off game two maybe that was the most i mean it was the most lopsided it was a two-run game yeah but like (laughs) You know, the Red Sox could have came back in that one. Yep. Um, and then game three, like, Jake Diekman coming on for a one-run save against Judge, Stanton, and Gallo and striking all three of them out. I know that sounds very cliche because it's like, oh, like, you know, the haters always talk about how much they strike out all the time, but it's like they're still legitimate threats, like better than any hitters yeah. in baseball. Right, right. And if they made contact, there was a good chance it was going to be a, an extra base hit. Especially <laughs> with the way Stanton was playing. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Every time I don't think he's hit a ball less than a hundred like ten miles an hour this year, and I'm being completely serious. Yeah. 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 Like, even just you know one single. Yeah. Well, th- well, singles are where he gets his most <laughs> exit velocity. Yes. It's pretty crazy what he's able to do. Um, mm-hmm. so this yeah. is just a line drive. Right. But even right. then, like he hit a hundred sixteen mile an hour home run that went like three hundred fourteen feet. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly, but still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was your third takeaway? It was, of course, I mean, I'm taking a little victory lap here. I have to. Stephen Kwan. Yeah. Has to. Uh, right? Five for five with a hit by pitch yesterday. Um, and that was his, I think he reached base in 13 consecutive plate appearances. Uh, he had an OBP of 867 at one point. <laughs> um, absolutely ridiculous stuff from Stephen Kwan this weekend in Kansas City. I think he hit one extra base hit, and it was, like, the one at-bat that I actually, like, tuned into other than just having the game on in the background. Yeah. Um, because, like, the the game yesterday was, like, 17-3 to or something like that, so, like, I kind of just tuned it out early. But then I saw he kept he just kept getting on, and I was like, <laughs> okay. Like, no, I, I remember I turned on his last at-bat. I was like, there's no way he goes 5-for-5, five five, right? And then he hits a double over the right fielder's head. Uh. Um, yeah, I mean, that was – I think that's my best take so far. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. When it, he's number one on your uh, players to watch so far. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Connor Joe is probably number two, um, but number one is for sure Stephen Kwan. Uh, I mean, he's. I mean, you know what? He's the best player in Cleveland Guardians history. Yeah, that's true. That's like, just a fact. You can't. You can't refute that at all. Right. R- correct. Yeah. 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 Um, so that was my third takeaway. Uh, watch Stephen Kwan. He's amazing and he does also he hasn't swung and missed yet either he hasn't swung and missed and he has a, a walk rate at like 25 percent like he's doing everything right that's amazing yeah that's amazing um all right uh should we do players to highlight now i guess so steven kwan just hit a double off of scott barlow why are my friends fighting <laughs> <laughs> that's i'm so conflicted just watching that <laughs> that's <laughs> Actually, he tripled, it looks like. Yeah, he, he had a triple. He tripled off Scott Barlow. Dang. Well, sometimes That's you're just going to run into uh, an uh, unstoppable force. Yeah. 
even if you're an immovable object like yes. Scott Barlow is. Yeah. <laughs> I need to see. It was a bases loaded triple, too, so I need to make sure he didn't uh, walk anyone. Cause, actually, I feel like we should explain the concept of the F-War League, even if it doesn't really have anything to do with this show, because yeah. it's probably something we'll be referencing. Yes, yes, it, yes. Because that's, I mean, it's just a fun thing. You yeah, know? yeah. You want to go ahead and do that? Yeah, I will gladly do that. So the F-War League was started uh, by a good friend of mine uh, on Instagram. Uh, in 2019, where it's literally just you draft a team on opening or like near opening day, it's you know a player at each position, three outfielders, three starting pitchers, two relief pitchers, and a utility player, and you just it's just whoever calculates the most F war at the end of the season wins. It's as simple as that. Um, and since it's a homemade league, there's no platform that we're running it on. Like there's no ESPN, there's no Yahoo Sports. Um, so, you know, we have to keep track of all of it ourselves. Uh, I'm the commissioner of one with Chris and some of our college friends right now. Uh, it's been a lot of fun in the, in the few days. The draft was a good time. Yep. yep. Um, but you know, that's something that we're going to be doing this season. Uh, I'm excited for your for, first F4 league because it's, I mean, oh, mo- I'm pumped. Mo- yeah. most of the season, it's so good because it's fantasy baseball, but without the daily commitment, which is probably the hardest part of it. Right, right. And you can still, you know, you can make moves. We only allow three moves per season, and it's, like, injury replacements. So, like, if one of your guys gets injured, you don't want to keep him there the rest of the year. So you just you replace them with someone else. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at mine right now. I'm in sixth out of ten so mm-hmm. far. And I'm, yeah. you know, I keep going in my head. You know, it's a long season. It is. No, like, <laughs> the first few days mean nothing. Yeah, yeah. Like the fir- like the the good teams will really start to show themselves in like late May. Right. Like that's when you want to start paying attention to the standings. Yeah, for sure. Um yeah, I'm not I'm thinking uh JT Real Muto will get out of the negatives yeah, along for sure. with uh Brandon Woodruff and Jose Barrios. I think uh I think the guy that won our league last year, the one that I was in, was in last at the end of April. So hmm. like yeah, it really can be anyone. Yeah, it definitely uh, can be. And, yeah, given, given like, what the top three look like right now, mm-hmm. I, don't know, I, don't, I don't necessarily think it's going to stay the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. Also, like, being down by one win means nothing. Right. Like, like, that's not a steep hill to climb. You can legit get there in one day if you have a really good day and someone has a really tough day. Oh, because yeah. I was looking at, I was updating your team today, Chris. You had like five players go over four. <laughs> and if you go over four, that's just like this me this league has made me appreciate how difficult it is to accumulate F war. Yeah. Because like seriously, you go over four, like that's negative one. Yeah, negative point one. Yeah, negative point one, yeah. Yeah, that's uh And like you hit a home run that's like maybe point two. Yeah. Yeah. Like you like you go one for four with a home run, like you <laughs> might have point two. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um like it's hard to do that. Yeah, it's fun. I'm excited. I actually, um, just for the fun of it, I I went before the season started. I went to all my players uh, on the like fan graph, whatever the fan graphs projection is. Mm-hmm. I did projection for their wins above replacement, <laughs> and I added them all together. <laughs> I love it. It was projected for 55.4. That would be good enough to be contending for a championship. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think uh I think I put myself in a decent spot. Um The first year that I did it, I finished last out of 10 people and my team had like 33 wins. Yeah. This Yeah, yeah. cuz ha- all my guys either were injured or underperformed. Right. <laughs> I mean, strong po- you know, it's, good. it's a possibility with everyone. Yeah. Especially when you can't, when you don't have a bench, um, but yeah, that can we can, that can lead into our uh, first edition. Yes, first twenty twenty two edition of players to highlight, starting with uh, the first twenty twenty two edition of. How about that? Um. So, who do you have for us? This week. So I feel like I've made it a tradition for myself to have two How About That's for our first edition of the year because I did so last year and I have done so again this year. Um, do you remember the last team that we highlighted on How About That last year? Like the last team to get highlighted? It was the Mets. It was the Mets. That's right. So uh, starting out this year, we have Eduardo Escobar. Wow. Who had a big weekend against Washington. Uh, 
a lot of these numbers are not going to sustain themselves because they just can't. Right. But it's it's showing a good um, change in tendencies for him. So going into this year, uh, he has a career high walk rate of eight percent. That's like the highest he's had in a season. Uh, this year, his walk rate is currently at twenty one point four percent. So in the early goings, he's making it a habit to be more patient at the plate. Um, obviously, that's not he, he's not going to finish the year at twenty one point four. Spoilers, it's not yeah, going to happen. Yeah, yeah. But you know, if you can get above ten percent this year, that's going to be a really good investment that the Mets made this off season to go along with many other others. Uh, he also has a sixty two point five percent hard hit rate. And an 89.4 mile an hour average exit velocity, which would be a career high for him. Uh, and he is so he has played three games, and he hit a double in each of them. Uh, and he is the first player in New York Mets history with a double in each of their first three games in a season. Not the team's first three games, because he didn't play the third game, but each of the players' first three games of the season. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, Eduardo Escobar. How about that? And my other how about that? Uh, you know, I, I chose a, a pretty well-known free agent to, or former free agent for my first. How about that? My second one, guy that just uh, strolled onto the block, new kid, Johan Duran from the Minnesota Twins. He is a relief pitcher. Have you heard of him? Um, I think I've, I think I've heard of him, but okay, not like uh, I haven't I haven't re- watched him or anything. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell you on him right here. Johan Duran made his Major League debut on Friday. Was that, yeah, I think it was Friday. And he struck out uh, four batters in two innings. Uh, that is pretty excellent. That's 18 strikeouts per nine. And the interesting thing about him is that he primarily throws a splitter. And through two innings of work, he has thrown more 95-plus mile-an-hour splitters than any pitcher since 2008. And he's probably thrown more 95 mile an hour splitters than any pitcher ever i don't think people were doing that before 2008 yeah, no. No, no, um no. yeah 95 mile an hour splitters that it doesn't happen he threw six of them on friday no one has ever thrown more than five i think jerry's familia had the most before that and he's been in the league since the start of the Statcast era You're right so he's been doing that uh on various occasions for seven years johan duran did it six times in his first appearance ever he also gave up four batted balls with uh, an average exit velocity of 87.4 miles per hour, which is relatively slow, and an average launch angle of negative 15.2 degrees. Um, If this guy can consistently throw that splitter and keep it with that speed and keep these batted ball tendencies, this is legitimately a revolutionary pitcher. It's something we haven't seen before. It's something that we can see future archetypes with. Yeah. Like, there is no other Johan Duran right now. That's true. That's true. Very good find. Uh, Johan Duran. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Johan Duran. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like with how hard he throws his splitters, it probably almost acts as a a regular sinker. Yeah. It's, yeah, I, I'd like to. Yeah, I probably. It's probably a sinker with more break. Yeah, I'd probably. Yeah, for sure. If if it has more vertical mo- movement, that's pretty deadly. Um. If it has more v- vertical movement than a sinker, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, my uh, my, how about that is uh, the guy who is in the 100th percentile in expected WOBA currently, which is Andrew Vaughn. Uh, in his second year in the league, uh, and his hard hit rate has been 60% this year, and his average exit velocity, uh, exit velocity has been 95.1 miles per hour. Obviously, I don't expect that to uh, stay the same, but, uh, you know, he looks like he is improving. Along with that, he has taken 26 swings, and he has swung and missed just once. Uh, also, what might be a little bit of a revelation, um, maybe a little bit of an, of a, of an improvement, uh, last year he had a 265 slugging and a thr- 32.6% whiff rate on breaking pitches. But this year, in three plate appearances that have ended on breaking pitches, two of them have been home runs. So, uh, Andrew Vaughn, he's getting my... That's a good one. I feel like I had him as either a... I think I had him as a slightly alarming last year. Um, it was either that or a how about that. I think it was a slightly alarming, though. But I feel like I did highlight him at some point. Yeah. 
I feel like I might have had him as a as a slightly also, alarming. I feel like or I've I've thought of new terminology that we need to adopt this year. So, you know, we have some uh, terms for our players to highlight. If a player is highlighted on how about that and they're later in the season highlighted on slightly alarming, it is a freeze over. Correct, a freeze over. And vice versa, if we have a player on slightly alarming that later gets shown on how about that, it is a ARR comeback special. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. I've thought of two more things that we need to do. So, Chris, you and I, if we ever use one of our players to watch on either of these segments, I feel like they need some recognition. Um, so I've thought of one of them. Uh, okay. If you if you highlight a player that you highlighted at the beginning of the season on your players to watch as a how about that, that's a victory lap. All right. It's a victory yeah. lap. That's what we're calling it. Love uh, it. Yeah, <laughs> and we need it. We I need to. We need to brainstorm a term for if we highlight one of them on slightly alarming. Yeah, yeah, that's because we can't just have it. How about that term and not a slightly alarming term? That's true. That's true. Yeah, we need that. Um, I mean, yeah, we might need that soon, yeah. actually. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now we go from the highs to the lows. We're talking about uh, players or subjects that have been underperforming. Uh, and here is our first 2022 edition of Slightly Alarming. Uh, who do you have for Slightly Alarming? Okay, so we call this segment Slightly Alarming, and usually the slightly is emphasized at the beginning of the season because usually it's yeah. like a, a one-appearance sample or a three-game sample. Um, this one, I feel like there is actually a bit of worry to it. Um, Julio Arias did not look good uh, in his outing on Sunday. Interesting. Uh, his line was two innings pitched, six hits, three earned runs, two walks, zero strikeouts, and one home run. Uh, really did not do anything very well. He gave up six runs, three of them were earned. I guess that's one little uh, bright spot is that he didn't actually give up as many runs as there were on the board when he left the game. But his average fastball velocity was at the lowest point of any appearance he's made in his career. From 2016 to right now, the lowest fastball velocity in any appearance he's made was last Sunday. From 2019 to 2021, Julio Arias averaged 94 to 95 miles per hour on his fastball. On Sunday, it topped out at 93.1 miles an hour. That is not a good sign. That is a pretty significant drop uh, in one start. Um, He threw it 23 times on Sunday and got zero whiffs. It is the only start in his career to this point where he had zero whiffs and a slugging percentage above 300 on his fastball, and his slugging percentage against was 400. So that 300 is not a cherry pick at all. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the weather in That's, Denver on <laughs> April. It, t- that is fair. April like 10. it could have been a weather in Denver thing, but. I'm that's something that, you know, if that's not just a weather in Denver thing, like, there is serious cause for concern with Julio Arias. Right, right. Going forward. Um, but, yeah, Julio Arias. Slightly alarming. Um, I'm just looking at the... What? Where can I find it? That's the issue. <laughs> um, April 10. Yeah, highs of 60. It wasn't alarming. No. Um. Julio Arias was alarming uh, with his fastball, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, he topped out at 93, and he usually averages 94 to 95. Mm-hmm. Pretty wild. Um, my slightly alarming is whatever we're going to call it, <laughs> uh, because he is – well, he's actually our player to watch, Alex Kirilov. <laughs> um, he is 0 for 12 with five strikeouts. And he has a 154 expected slugging and a 102 expected WOBA. Whoops. Uh, yeah, the, you know, not great from a guy we expected a lot out of because he, you know, we, we went over how, you know, he had a 367 expected WOBA last year and we expected him to do pretty big things uh, this year because of, you know, how, how good he was with the uh, quality of contact. Um, and right now he does not have a batted ball between three and 30 degrees. So yeah, wow. it's all grounders or, or high fly balls. And you know, there was one that was like 31 degrees, which is sometimes acceptable, but I think it was hit like 75 miles yeah, no, per hour. It's gotta be like minimum one Oh five. Yeah. For yeah. That to yeah. Work out. Um, and, uh, along with that, 
He has a 48% whiff rate overall and an 80% whiff rate on curveballs. So uh, Alex Kirilov right now, I don't expect it long term, but right now. Slightly alarming. And we, what about the, uh, the talk of shame? Uh, the, t- the talk of shame. I'm trying to think of. It's um, the one that I've brainstormed so far. There's, there's, there. I feel like there's terms for like parents disappointed in their children. <laughs> <laughs> problem or problem child. That that seems a little weird. Yeah, it might be, <laughs> um, especially when you're talking about a grown man. But yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That We're could gonna, be. I mean, I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll brainstorm and we'll have one to you by the next time we have to highlight a player on slightly alarming that one of us. Had yeah, as our player to watch. Correct. This season. Correct. Alex Kirilov is on that list, though. He's on that list. Uh, we'll figure it out for sure. Yeah. So he's been, um, yeah, he's been an issue with uh, over twelve five strikeouts. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Anyway, that does it for players to highlight. I guess we will go into our. Oh my gosh, we got to do. Uh Probable matchups. Yeah. Our, wow, I missed this. Our preview of the week ahead. Um, it's so cool, like, the first time, uh, like, the series switches, and it's like, oh, my God, we got n- a new set of matchups now? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you're telling me, like... I don't have to watch Ray's Orioles the whole year? <laughs> so you, you, the, Dodgers and, or the Dodgers and Rockies aren't going to play each other 162 times in yeah. Coors Field? <laughs> they get to go other places? Because, yeah, by the way, I don't think we addressed it, but... The level of matchups, because usually I think MLB usually likes to have a good first week of matchups, mm-hmm. but since this was scheduled as the second week of matchups, matchups were not great. No. <laughs> like, there was nothing, outside of Red Sox Yankees, there was nothing to really look forward to that much. Like, mm-hmm. just looking at the Sunday matchups, like Brewers Cubs, like, not ma- not matched up too well, you know. Mariners Twins, I guess, was decent, but you know, Rangers Blue Jays, you know, kind of a bottom team versus a top team. You know, Reds Braves, uh, Mets Nationals, yeah, <laughs> Rays Orioles, Phillies A's, yeah, not great. But uh, but upcoming this week, uh, as I will be talking about series to watch, and Daniel will be talking about um, pitching matchups. Um, so for series to watch, uh, you have to look at. Yankees, Blue Jays, um, each coming off a, a series in which they won two out of three. Um, you know that's a; those are teams that are you know competing for an American League East crown. So it's good to see. Um, it'll be good to see uh, what they'll have in store. I know on uh, Tuesday or does it start today? Yeah, it starts uh, tonight, Monday. Uh, it's you have Jamison Tyon versus Alec Manoa. Then mm-hmm. Tuesday, it is Nestor Cortez versus Yusei Kikuchi. Then Wednesday, Wednesday it is Garrett Cole versus Jose Barrios, which should be a, a good matchup. And, yeah, it's a four-game series. Uh, Thursday will be featuring Luis Severino and Kevin Gosman. So uh, all the pitching matchups look very even, as it normally does at the beginning of the, of the year. So, yeah, Yankees, Blue Jays, and then I guess in the National League, uh, also in the East Coast, uh, one to pay attention to. There's a couple to pay attention to. I won't probably, I probably won't go into as mm-hmm. grand a detail, but Phillies Mets uh, at Citizens Bank uh, Park, and then Giants Padres at Oracle. Uh, so yeah, some good competitive matchups. You know, for a little bit of a change this time around. So those should be. Uh, those should be fun to watch. What do you got for the day by days? Yeah, so for the day by days, uh, I guess we'll start on Tuesday because I don't know when we are dropping this, but yeah. I feel like the matchups on Monday will be dated by the time people are listening to this. Yeah, uh, you have the all Ohio matchup in uh, uh, Guardians versus Reds. I did definitely did not almost say the forbidden name. Yeah, um, <laughs> but you have the a pair of aces going in Shane Bieber and Tyler Male. Uh, Tyler Molly will be making his first start in Great American Ballpark. I mentioned in um, the season previews episode for the Reds that Tyler Molle, um struggles a lot at um, 
at Great American Ballpark, and he's one of the best pitchers in the league on the road. Also struggles against the Guardians in the brief time that he's faced them. Uh, 22 plate appearances against the Guardians and a 980 FIP. That's not great. Weird. Uh, Matt Brash will be making his Major League debut. That is an ARR alumni. Actually, I guess it's an STBNL alumni. Yeah. We'll, we'll call it. Whatever. Well, it's we'll it's it the name. same It's the same franchise. It's like the, um, the same way that, uh, um, what is it? George Sisler is, is one of the best in the uh, yeah. Orioles organization. Yeah. It's part, it was, you know, in the ARR is in the STB. Yeah. It's like Walter Johnson with the Twins. Yeah. 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 It's like that. Uh, you have a couple <laughs> of lefties going in Blue Jays, Yankees, like you mentioned. Yusei Kikuchi making his debut for Toronto with Nestor Cortez, a fan favorite. Also just an interesting guy in the mound uh, that he'll be going. A um, couple of young lefties going on the West Coast in a rare Marlins-Angels matchup. I love that this is the first year for ARR that we get the weird interleague matchups. Like, it's not the West playing the West, the East playing the East. Yeah. Because it's been that in every single year that we've done ARR. Like, what was it? Um, what were the cool ma- – like, A's Phillies last yeah. weekend. Like, that was dope. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, this week we get Marlins, the Angels. Um, uh, Jesus Lazardo making his season debut. That's a guy to watch for. And then Patrick Sandoval, who was my uh, Angels player to watch. It's going to be a fun one. Uh, you also have the all meme matchup in Dodgers Twins. Another another weird matchup. You have Andrew Heaney versus Chris Archer. That's funny. Uh, Andrew Heaney as a meme for just kind of being himself, giving up a lot of home runs, and then Chris Archer for uh, infamous trade that doesn't look as bad now. Right. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, Luis Garcia will be facing Madison Bumgarner in uh, Astros Diamondbacks. Uh, ooh, here's an interesting one. Yu Darvish versus Alex Cobb in um, the Padres-Giants matchup. Both of these pitchers have struggled mightily against the other team. In uh, 82 plate appearances against the current San Francisco Giants roster, uh, Yu Darvish has a 28% strikeout rate, which is very good, but a 3.65 WOBA against and a 6.80 FIP. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, Alex Cobb in 54 plate appearances against the current San Diego Padres Roger, roster has a... 368 Woba against and an 832 FIP. Uh, mm. And that is also, but also he has it on a 1.4 degree launch angle, which is good. And my matchup of the night, uh, I think this is just a really good one for narratives. Uh, Tyler McGill versus Zach Wheeler in Mets Phillies. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, two- Mets fans are very, very high on Tyler McGill. Um, and. For good reason. You know, he had a very good outing against the Nationals on opening day last season. And Zach Wheeler is their old friend. Um, wow, in 181 plate appearances versus the current Mets roster, Zach Wheeler's FIP is 1.73. Hmm. He has kind of had their number. Yeah. Uh, ever since. Ever since he left. That's interesting. Uh, going into Wednesday, I need to prepare this segment on the fly. I, I'm using... I'm u- I upgraded from just, like, the daily pitching matchups on the MLB app to, like, the probable pitchers on Savants. I wanted to use, like, the daily matchups to highlight some batters that have, like, had some success or some struggles against pitchers, but Savant right. just took that away for no reason. Um, Oof. Max Freed will be going against Josiah Gray in Nats Braves. Um, that'll be an inter- interesting one. You will have the Christianta Classic, one of your favorites, the don't throw it above 91 miles per hour matchup in Kyle Hendricks versus Zach Thompson in Love it. Uh, Cubs Pirates. Love it. Yeah. Um, oh, baby, I'm going to save that one. Actually, no, I'm not going to save that one. Max Serger versus Aaron Nola. That's, I feel like they've both faced each other a lot. Uh, oh, yeah. They definitely have, yeah. 184 plate appearances for Serger against the Phillies roster, 232 for Nola against the Mets. Serger has a 206 FIP and a 144 average against. Uh, in true Aaron Nola fashion, he is a 265 average against against the, uh, <laughs> against the Mets. I'm sure his expected batting average is, yeah, it's 246. It's yeah. some points lower. Uh, 294 FIP, though, so that's excellent. Um, you have... Clayton Kershaw making his season debut, I believe. I don't think he's pitched yet this year against Chris Paddock of the Twins. He just can't get away from facing the Dodgers, apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, that'll be a fun one. I feel like we know when Clayton Kershaw makes his first start because there will be some, like, MLB post of, like, him, him, uh, him, like, 
getting a nice uh, curveball strikeout looking, and then it'll be some caption of something implying that he's like still got it or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. kind of routine. I feel like I've seen that a lot. He Maybe, does though. Yeah, he still has. He's yeah, for sure. He had a three. He had a flat three FIP last year. Yeah, uh, we have the t- we have turned back the clock night in St. Louis with. Uh, the 2014 classic of Zach Greinke versus Adam Wainwright. Oh, my God. <laughs> Royals-Cardinals. Actually, that could be more like 2006. Yeah. You think about it, 2007. When did Wainwright become a full-time starter? Um, yeah, probably probably late late aughts. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's going to be a fun one just for just for old time's sake. Yeah. <laughs> it's very funny seeing uh, yeah, Zach Greinke with the Royals again. It feels very weird. It, it, also, it does feel weird. Like, you don't really remember him for the Royals because, like, his – I mean, his best year was in Kansas City. But, like, you know, I grew up with him on the Giant or on him, him on the Dodgers. And, like, it feels weird to see him on the Royals, but it also feels right. Yeah. Because that's just – that's where he was. Right, right. Um, you have newly acquired Sean Manaya, who th- went six no-hit innings in his Padres debut going against Logan Webb. That's going to be a fun one. Yeah. That's going to be yep. a good one. Uh, this is, you know, like the Wednesday is going to be like when all the, the rotation turns to number one again. So there's just going to be a bunch of aces facing each other. Yeah, it is. Uh, Frankie Montas versus Shane McClanahan. That one's a good one. Jose Barrios versus Garrett Cole. Yep. Uh, Corbin Burns versus John Means. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie Ray versus Dallas Keuchel. Two completely opposite lefties. That's very true. <laughs> two completely opposite lefties. Matchup of the night. Uh, once again, for narratives, uh, in Red Sox Tigers, Nathan Eovaldi versus Eduardo Rodriguez. Yeah, it's their number, uh, basically one number one and two from last year. Yep. Um. So yeah. then the last battle one, of the Babip. Battle of the Babip. Yeah. <laughs> Who will give up more hits? <laughs> Over or under seventeen and yeah. a half hits between the two of them. There will be no walks. Each guy will have like at least eight strikeouts. Yep. <laughs> but the yep. final score will be seven to five. Yeah, that's <laughs> very true. So moving on to Thursday, um, when when's I don't know the next time we're gonna record, but uh, we, I don't yeah. know how far I want to go with these previews. I feel we'll just stop on Thursday and then yeah. we'll see where we're at at the end of the week. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe yeah, we'll see. Um, on Thursday you have uh, Logan Gilbert going against the White Sox. The White Sox have not announced their starter yet. It'll probably be Luke Giolito. Um, so that would be right. an exciting one hypothetically. You will have Brandon Woodruff going against the Cardinals in the uh, looks like the series opener for uh, Brewers and Cardinals. It's going to be the Brewers home opener as well, so it's cool that they get Woodruff on the mound. Um, you're going to have I'll save that for match of the night. Um, yeah, I'll save that for match of the night. Kevin Gosman versus Luis Severino. Uh, Kevin Gosman for me is like a golden example of how much differently I look at pitchers now that the F4 league is a thing and I have to keep track of him every day. Because yeah. Kevin Gosman, if you look at his last start, uh, he get, like he had a really good strikeout to walk ratio, didn't give up any home runs, but he has a 540 ERA. Yeah. So I was like, like I looked at it the other day. I was like, wait, Kevin Gosman is didn't have a good start. I thought he got like point <laughs> two F4. Uh, he'll be facing Luis Severino. Um, is yeah, so we got bad up in that first game. A lot of team, a lot of teams just haven't announced their starters. Matchup of the night for right now. Uh, Kyle Gibson sneaky had a really good outing on uh, I think it was Friday or I think it was Saturday. Yeah, it was Saturday. He'll be going up against Sandy Alcantara, who is looking to have a bounce back start. Five walks uh, in his season debut. Uh. Yeah, so that's that's something that's got to change. But other than that, those are the matchups for the night. Uh, and uh, yeah, just. It's going to be a good week. The first week of baseball is going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's I think I think series-wise, there's a lot more to watch. I think yeah. this past week of series, you know, there was, there was a lot to be desi- desired. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, at this point in the year, there's not going to be a lot of meaning to many series, but it feels like there's more meaning yeah. to these with, you know. You know what's going to be cool, though? I mean, I don't know how exactly the schedule is made but like the end of the season will probably be really dope because that's when they just pushed all like the the canceled games yeah that's too. true that's true yeah looking forward to that for sure mm-hmm. um all right well that does it for previews and that does it for uh the the first um above replacement radio you know of the of the 2022 season yes, actual is. season um you know we were 
happy to be joined by you uh we hope you enjoyed this one if you want to follow us on social media follow me on twitter at chris underscore gianta and follow daniel on both twitter and instagram at daniel underscore current and follow the show instagram at above replacement radio for all the show needs um and we hope you enjoyed this one and we hope to see you kind of whenever <laughs> uh where we will be talking all the happenings in major league baseball once again see you then this conversation this conversation is over is over